Hi there, I'm Anthony Chung, and I'm the Head of Market Analysis here at Amplify Trading. Every weekday morning, I'll deliver a fundamental rundown ahead of the European Open. But if you subscribe to the channel, you'll also get content from the rest of the team. So let's begin. Good morning. It is Tuesday, the 22nd of September. Hope you are doing well. Uh, quick shout out to my wife. 10 years today since we first met. Time flies um, when you are having fun. I did say to her yesterday, 10 years would be uh, uh, almost a life sentence uh, in some worlds. But um, anyway, moving on, a quick look at what we've got on the agenda this morning. What I'm going to talk to you about is a little bit about the overnight session, uh, lower generally overnight, continued beaten down in terms of some of those big banking stocks like HSBC uh, and Standard Chartered in their Hong Kong listed shares following that news about US anti-money laundering and their involvement potentially in that act type of activity. Uh, so Asia lower overnight, following on from the queue from the lower close on Wall Street. Uh, we did see a bit of a late bounce actually, particularly tech led going into the closing bell, which did narrow some of those losses, but generally lower. Japan still out on a market holiday. Uh, we had some comments from Jerome Powell last night, but largely a reiteration of what he said before, very much just unveiling, uh, I guess, his defensive policies that exist to now politicians, which he's going to be speaking to throughout the week uh, on Capitol Hill, or virtually at least. Uh, an update on the UK COVID situation. Obviously, it's moving fairly quickly at the moment, and the PM is going to give a major uh, speech later on this evening. And there's some big kind of policy U-turns about people now being encouraged to work from home. There's going to be some hospitality industry changes in regards to bars and restaurants, and I can get you up to speed on that. But definitely, this could have or well have implications on the speed and shape of the recovery in the UK and that does need to be factored into the pound which obviously was really the main focal point of yesterday's session not just the UK but mainland Europe uh, the idea of then um, the kind of slow progression on stimulus talks coming out of the US uh, the simmering US China trade situation all of these things rearing their head at once uh, and causing that negative session that we had yesterday. And then other things I can update you on is oil, Tesla and the calendar ahead. So before I get into these stories in more detail, let's have a look at the charts and what have we got on the agenda. Uh, and a little bit of a slight repeat of where we kind of left things yesterday. The dollar has just started to bump up a little bit after a very sideways Asia Pacific session. And a little bit of strength here in the Dixie has seen it come back towards basically unchanged on the session in close proximity to yesterday's highs now in the Dixie. And uh, as a consequence, I'd be keeping an eye today on these major currency pairs once again on the downside levels. Yesterday's low following the route that we had with the dollar led strength weighing on these major dollar FX pairs. Then 117.50 in the euro worth keeping an eye on cable actually even closer toward those lows we printed yesterday. Uh, which came in the evening around 6 p.m. London. We're trading around 20 pips away from there at the moment. Looking at sterling from a slightly longer time perspective, um, there's a really key area, of course, which the market responded to very nicely, which was the 200 DMA um, only a matter of weeks ago, 10 days ago or so. Uh, and that was a key uh, pivot point from when uh, a lot of the focus, of course, wasn't so much on COVID, but on Brexit, when Johnson was playing the strong hand going into that eighth round of Brexit talks, which obviously finished with uh, the presentation of the um, internal market bill coming out of the UK, and that got Europe's back up and so on. So the deterioration of that increased risk of a no deal, that pricing uh, hit that eventual low back on around the 11th. Uh, before we bounce back up and here we are back down at these key levels again uh, again that also encapsulating around the highs that we were seeing on the recovery through may into early june as well so quite interested to see how the market reacts here and around these levels you can see here technically that low on the 11th was also marking up some highs around the 21st 23rd of july before the break higher so we are within distance of there at the moment around 50 60 pips or so to the downside and that for me if I just put an ellipse around here, this is going to be a really key area which could come into play uh, later today's key area of support. A break of that, then I'd be looking for a deeper move down to around 126.74, looking on the daily continuation here. And then the next really technical level of interest isn't seen down all the way to more toward the 125 handle. And obviously you've got to take out 126 even as well uh, on that descent if that were to materialize. So key day, um, dollar is 
seeing some strength here at the European Open, so I'd definitely be mindful of that. Um, elsewhere, otherwise, gold um, has had a, a pretty decent bounce, and, and it's uh, recaptured a 1900 handle, of course, following the quite abrasive sell-off we had yesterday, which was very reminiscent of what we were seeing uh, during uh, the portion of that that kind of unwinding of the big tear that gold went on through 2000 initially um, and so we're just trading around pivot at the moment um, and just keeping an eye on the range here in gold futures just as we go through the main pickup in volume through the European um, open and that being the Asia Pacific low that was seen down around 1911 uh, and we're just testing there at the moment and that could be interesting if the dollar does continue to pick up and accelerate on the upside be looking if we get a triggered break on there, we could see a, a deeper, heavier move back down to 1900 again in pretty quick fashion, um, given how gold as an asset typically tends to move on these breaks at technical levels. Um, otherwise, elsewhere in the equity space, obviously uh, negative sessions yesterday, um, albeit a quite a, aggressive bounce off those lows into the final half an hour of trade on Wall Street. Um, obviously, we were looking at the daily chart yesterday and hopefully uh, my briefing kind of made sense because yesterday did kind of play out as we were describing in that we broke technically that 50 DMA and trend line, a lot of negative COVID uh, news, talk about a UK second national lockdown, albeit we're not quite at that point yet, but um, new restrictions coming in, similar developments on COVID front elsewhere in mainland Europe. And uh, we did think that equities were susceptible to a pullback and we were looking at those lower down levels and and certainly the market did respond to some of these uh, predetermined marks that we were looking at from the initial high that we saw from the US-China situation uh, before um, that kind of intensified and the second wave also started to hit uh, in regard to uh, in the US and the Sun Belt region. That was that high we printed back in uh, early June, if you remember the kind of southern and western states in the US. And so, yeah, market responded to that. But look, we're, we're under a bit of pressure again, just going to the European Open. So that continues to remain uh, a key level. And anywhere below there, definitely 3200, 3192, which would be the support level that was really a, a strong level through uh, from mid to late July before then we started to accelerate to the upside. Uh, that would be a very important level uh, to keep an eye on. Um, meanwhile, in, in oil, uh, following the general kind of demand reaction, I guess, to an increased threat of COVID concerns globally, it came under some pressure yesterday. Um, so just still be keeping an eye on that for the time being. It's down 10 cents this morning. It's a relatively flat, but as you can see here, finding a little bit of resistance in the overnight Asia Pacific session um, at around the $40 handle, which was just short of the pivot and also that low point that we printed back on the 17th quite a nice area of technical resistance uh, kind of around uh, this area here if we get back down to retest the lows that we saw from yesterday uh, we'd be keeping an eye of course down at that low that we printed uh, more like the 38 83 85 type level I'm going to talk about oil in a moment there's some other stories to be aware of as well uh, in regards to Libya that's probably worth uh, commenting on as well um, fixed income markets, T-notes pretty flat, obviously caught a bit of a bid um, in yesterday's session just given the equity sell-off, uh, general uh, kind of flight to quality move that we're seeing, um, but since then has steadied, albeit it's held on to some of those gains that were seen yesterday and we're trading uh, with support the pivot up a tick of 139.19. All right, let's get into some of the headlines. What have we got then? Let's, let's focus on, um, as I said, overnight in Asia, um, a negative session, uh, as I mentioned, HSBC Standard Chartered shares were down again another two and a half or so percent. That takes the two-day loss for those banking giants down to around seven percent now. Um, and again, just to repeat, that's after then they were named in a report about alleged international banks that have flagged two trillion dollars in suspicious transfers to the U.S. anti-money laundering authority. So this had weighed on other banks as well. Uh, DB being one, of course, yesterday. Um, other things that have uh, uh, we talked about yesterday, which definitely was, I think, a contributing factor as well to um, some of the general mentality towards the negativity yesterday, was when we were talking about this um, 
the passing of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and what the replacement of that might mean. It's a real contentious issue now for politicians in Washington. And does that detract from the timeliness of getting a, a next round of fiscal stimulus coming uh, out of America, which is obviously crucial to support what is still a fairly precarious and fragile recovery at the moment. Um, so days were all yesterday. Jerome Powell did speak last night. Um, he didn't speak so much as in his text got released of where he's going to be speaking later on today to the House Financial Services Committee. Uh, Powell said that the U.S. economy, flash it up, U.S. economy uh, is improving but has a long way to go before fully recovering from the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, so this is the text before he's scheduled to deliver these comments live later today. Um, he does speak actually three times this week. He's of course going to be joined as well um, by the Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin as they appear before lawmakers to talk about the various different monetary and fiscal responses that they've put into place um, since the pandemic began and how they're looking to support the economy and where things might go in the future. Generally speaking, these types of events when central bankers speak to politicians is more about defending their decision making, the success or, or not of the policies of which they've implemented. The politicians typically say they should have done more, they should have acted quicker and so on. Um, so it doesn't really have too much in the way of market related implications. However, of course, this is two very senior people speaking. And of course, Powell has the propensity to move the markets violently should he say something off cue, but the likelihood of that is particularly low. So I wouldn't be expecting too much from this, but just to be aware of. So that leads us then into one of the main stories, which is in the UK, a really fast developing story. Um, and the latest news I'm sure, you, I'm sure you saw last night was that Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, will announce new restrictions on bars and restaurants. Now, hospitality venues across England will have to close by 10pm from Thursday and will be limited to table service only. He has also reportedly told MPs that he'll be telling the nation tonight that people should work from home if they can. So continued political pressure here for, for the, the Tory government because you know there's a lot of um, changing of policy that's happened multiple times, a lack of then therefore clarity and what people's understanding are of restrictions for one, um, and this whole idea of encouraging then people back to work, which has been quite a mainstay of, uh, of general comms coming out of number 10. Uh, for the last couple of weeks, that's going to get flipped, just given the gravity of the situation of what the medical advisors in the UK were unveiling yesterday. I think strategically, from a, a political strategy point of view, very purposefully done. Boris not talking at those events. Leave that to the medical guys, um, and then he can come out and strike a slightly different chord, uh, of course, and then uh, he can just act or say he's acting upon medical advice that slightly disassociates himself from the end result of economic uh, implications in terms of job loss and so on. So I think that all makes sense. Um, just to recap, the chief scientific advisor, Patrick Valance, uh, warned Monday that the current infection rate, of which the number of cases is doubling every week, could lead to 50,000 new cases by mid-October without urgent action, meaning the alert level is now being moved back from three to four, uh, which basically suggests now rising rapidly and probably exponential growth of the virus. Now, that headline, I think it was 48,000, 50,000, let's say, um, new cases by mid-October, um, that sounds incredibly sensational. And obviously, the media jumped on that. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if I was, you know, thinking of, again, strategy from a government side, that that was purposefully done. Um, this this virus has to be taken under control, and one of the main things is um, people's adherence to um, the rules and the restrictions being put into place, which obviously has been fairly loose, as we've seen from the lack of social distancing that's been present over the last couple of weeks that's kind of led to a large portion of this situation. So don't believe, though, the 50,000 by mid-October. You know, the way that this works is kind of like when um, in the banking sector we do stress tests. And so when we do stress tests, for example, we would run an economy through multiple different scenarios ranging from ultra positive to absolutely almost um, a, a devastating scenario that might occur, like a black swan event, to see whether or not then the, bank, the banking sector can withstand an, an, a shock 
of, of high magnitude. So here then, it's kind of a similar type thing. I think the press obviously have an agenda. Uh, it's obviously a great headline to run about you know the amount, how violently the virus is, is, is growing. And so, yeah, I'd just be mindful of the fact that don't you know, be a little bit more reading between the lines of what the government's doing here. I think it's government-led, trying to control. If you can f scare monger people to a certain degree, then they will become more uh, in line with the restrictions you're putting in place. But equally so, the media have an agenda to push these types of sensational headlines. So 50,000 is unlikely to happen. It's a very low case probability but does certainly explain then the actions and gives validation to what the government is likely to do today and in the coming weeks if we lead to more um, nationwide type lockdowns. Now, what does that mean? Well, economically, the reason why the pounds come under pressure is that uh, even just a two-week shutdown, which was being um, talked about in the press and the FT just a couple of days ago about the potential uh, half-term period in the latter part of October as the potential for a two-week shutdown, um, that in itself, according to analysts at JP Morgan, um, could knock at least 2% off the nation's GDP. So, so remember, the entire uh, main lockdown we went through through the period of April, really, was when, when it was at its most strict, uh, that basically caused a second quarter reaction of a, of a negative 20% growth in the UK. So every day that happens... It has implications in the economy and it's even just a two-week shutdown could add another 2% um, in terms of the potential for the UK uh, and, and altering its trajectory of recovery. So hence the reason why this is a real delicate decision for the government to make is there's obviously strict, um, huge implications for the economy. Um, to give you an idea though, I think what will be quite interesting is Bank of England Governor Bailey is speaking uh, in actually an hour's time at 8.30 London time and a lot of people uh, will be be quite keen to what he has to say following the Bank of England meeting last week and they were talking about the fact that they've now started to speak to regulators about the implementation of potentially what would negative rates look like and how would it work. That's the most progressive conversation we've had on that particular policy tool and the markets are kind of quite um, interested to see whether he provides any more insight on that matter. Um, as I said in yesterday's briefing, I probably think it's less a case that he's going to be that um, explicit, given the fact that he's kind of done his job, uh, he's, he's moved that, that, that talking point along, but he doesn't want to overcommit. And so Bailey is speaking, though, and given the context of what's happening, certainly with this evolving COVID situation, it's going to be quite interesting. Remember, Bailey speaks today and Thursday. Uh, and then PM Johnson is going to speak later on this, uh, this evening. And actually, uh, that's going to be at 8 o'clock. That's 8 p.m. London, uh, where he's going to give one of his speeches um, about how they're confronting the virus and, and, and unveiling these latest measures. So, yeah, it does put more downside risk on the pound. And that was already uh, present given the backdrop of what would have been happening with the fairly wide gap still between the UK and Europe in this Brexit negotiation. That's kind of been parked now. And what the market's looking at is the implications of how bad is this coronavirus situation. So again, Sterling FX will become slightly more sensitive to these daily updates and toward then how big are the leaps that are happening and then what are the consequent actions that the government puts in place. The more onerous they are, the more impactful on, on the UK economy that will be and the more downside pressure that's going to add to, to sterling currency. And as I said, there's some technical levels around that 200 DMA will be quite quite key. Um, let's move elsewhere just to wrap up things. Um, continue to keep an eye on the uh, the general weather patterns in the Atlantic at the moment. It's been particularly busy uh, in different systems and particularly beta now is the one that people are looking at. As you can see here, tropical storm uh, in the Gulf. Now directionally, quite interestingly, it is basically moving perfectly ar along the Texan coastline, which is where the main bulk of the refining facilities do reside in that geographic region. Um, however, from what my understanding is, is that the this, this speed and intensity is nothing like what we saw, say, recently with Hurricane Laura. And so worth monitoring, given the fact that where it's where it's anticipated to go but at this point unless it takes a surprising uh, turn and starts to intensify uh, quickly then i don't think it'll be too much of a uh, of a moving point for for oil intraday 
Um, a few other things here though for oil, obviously it was lower yesterday, prolonged coronavirus restrictions weighing on the kind of demand uh, expectations here for energy products. Uh, one other thing is Libya. Uh, I know Libya, you probably heard about yesterday, but they're moving closer to reopen, reopening parts of its obviously uh, very embattled industry for oil, uh, just given the ongoing civil crisis that they've been going through for many years. Um, but um, companies have been told by the government at some fields that are free of foreign mercenaries and fighters to restart production. Now, what does that look like? And <clears throat> Libya is, is a country that can fluctuate hugely. Uh, if we're not used to these production numbers, uh, Libya, in, in, the, in, the, in the height of civil unrest, can literally go down to 50,000, 100,000 barrels per day being uh, produced. When things are um, the opposite and there's an ability to switch on their, their network again, they can go in excess of a million. So the variance is, is actually quite large. And I know in the grander scheme of things, when we talk OPEC, we're talking about 30 million kind of plus type level. However, don't forget the size of the types of supply cuts that we're talking about when we talk about OPEC plus. And a change of one nation by several hundred thousand barrels per day really does jeopardize the OPEC deal quite severely. Uh, and analysts at Goldman Sachs have been kind of looking at the numbers and they anticipate in their forecast that daily output could rise by 550,000 barrels per day in Libya. If, of course, all things remain status quo uh, and those facilities are able to open without disruption from militants and ongoing fighting within the country. Uh, so that definitely would be another component to monitor for the success or not of this OPEC ongoing plus deal that's in place at the moment. Um, yeah, moving on, final thing. I did tweet about this last night. It just happened to be at my, my desk last night and I saw Elon Musk was tweeting uh, and he tweeted this. Uh, and I don't, I don't really look too much and we don't trade or amplify single stocks, but obviously Tesla's always a talking point and Tesla's got his shareholder meeting and his battery day um, happening today. And so he tweeted last night, important to note that Tesla battery day unveil, unveil which is today, uh, this affects long-term production, especially semi Cybertruck and Roadster, but what we will announce will not reach serious high volume production until 2022. Uh, and their shares, consequently and aftermarket, did fall uh, in excess of 6% at one point. Uh, they actually finished in the aftermarket trade down about 59 5 um, a quick, quick word on this then. Um, it's interesting, as an example, uh, I think that if anyone who's new to, um, to trading and they're, they're definitely new to the fundamentals and how markets react to price, um, one thing that's very common is um, market reaction in stock prices um, often are a reflection of human psychology. Now, let me just before I get too deep, let me just give you a very quick overview. So negative bias refers to the fact that humans tend to overly focus on negative events um, in terms of information or emotions more than their positive counterparts. So if you think about normal, forget markets for a second, if you think about normal human emotion, we, we react much more sharply to negative things than positive things. So corporations know of this type of human um, fault, if you like, in terms of our imbalance of emotional reaction. And so if you are a listed company, what you want to do is mitigate then any type of negative reaction in your share price. So if you have uh, a, a negative story like Elon Musk knowing that there's high anticipation for a battery date unveiling of information on his tech and he knows that that can't live up to the hype so what does he do he comes out the day before and he drops in then the precursor to the main event which means when the main event occurs we're already aware of a large portion of the information and so as a net result you see a much more um, I guess rational reaction when he brings it up ahead of time and this offsets then a shock system one, system two type reaction that can consequently see a violent sell-off in, in a company's shares. Big banks are notorious at doing this. Um, big banks who have faced obviously massive multi-billion 
uh, dollar litigation fees in the post-financial crisis era. They would always come out ahead of their earnings report, kind of clear the deck. Yes, we're going to take a $2 billion charge because of FX manipulation. And then the quarterly earnings come out and stock price actually rises. Apple is notorious for this type of, uh, I don't want to call it manipulation, but it is almost that. Um, it's this kind of management, if you like, of the, the, the human investor which ultimately is the dictator of the value of that share price. So, yeah, I just wanted to give it a context to this. I thought it was uh, another kind of uh, example of Elon Musk's, um, kind of one of his main skills, which I think is kind of like Trump in a way, which is an ability to use these types of platforms like Twitter to curate a narrative uh, to his benefit uh, in that sense. All right, moving on to the calendar um, this is a quick summary, the top portion, obviously, Tuesday. What have we got today? It's a baby speaking in a, in a short while. Uh, you've got Feds Evans speaking later uh, as well at 3 o'clock London time. Evans discussing UK economy and monetary policy, and then Fed Chair Powell testifies to the House Financial Services panel later on this afternoon. But we've already had those pre-release uh, text comments, don't forget, last night. Uh, US data, uh, there's nothing really coming out otherwise elsewhere of great significance in UK and Europe. So in the US, no 130s, but you've got existing home sales and the Richmond Fed Manufacturing Index. Uh, from a speaker's point of view, perhaps this is a little bit easier. This incorporates everyone. Uh, so these times here on this column are London. So Bailey 830, you've got ECB's Panetta speaking at 1, Fed Zemmons non-voter at 3, ECB's Lane um, Philip Lane, of course, was one of the most interesting speakers of late, who was one of the first to raise those concerns about the firmer euro. Uh, the chief economist, he's speaking at, um, at 3 o'clock. Powell at 3.30, uh, and then Barkin, non-voter, albeit, is speaking at 5 p.m. And then for any uh, fixed income traders, you've got a Schatz auction this morning and a $52 billion in a two-year note auction. All right, that is it. Um, any questions at all? Uh, just give me a shout in the comments. Absolutely happy as always to, to help. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel as well. Really appreciate um, you helping be a part of the, the Amplify community online. Okay, guys, have a good day. I'll speak to you tomorrow.